It's Migraine Awareness Week, and we're dedicating this podcast to migraine and mental health. Did you know anxiety and depression are significantly more common in people with migraine than in healthy individuals? Mind matters in migraine. Welcome to the Heads Up Podcast, brought to you by the National Migraine Centre, the only UK charity treating migraine and headache. Hi everyone, Uh, today we're doing a special extended podcast as it's Migraine Awareness Week. Uh, It's Dr Katie Munro with Dr Jessica Briscoe. Hello. So this year we are raising awareness of how migraine affects mental health. The National Migraine Centre conducted a survey recently and we had such a big response, didn't we Jess? Yeah, really, it it went down really well. Thank you all so much for contributing to the survey as your stats have really helped us to understand the link between mental health and migraine. I mean, we're really aware of how migraine impacts on people's mental health from the people that we see week after week and they talk about anxiety and depression but there were some really shocking things that came out of that survey uh, and we want to share them with you this uh, this week. So we're going to go over to Dr David Bloomfield who's our chief exec of the National Migraine Centre. Um, David you were involved in this survey. Um, any initial thoughts about that? Yes um, hello there. Uh, first of all we were really pleased that so many people uh, joined in and supported the survey, um, nearly 2,000 respondents. Uh, I think the standout for me is that um, nearly 50% of people have experienced loneliness. That's really a a surprising result, I found. I think it's quite significant. I mean, so you said it's surprising. Um, Did you feel that it would be a lot lower than that? I didn't really have a preconception because I didn't realise quite how isolating it was. Mm. It really can be. I mean, I, I speak to people all the time who say that as well as the physical pain and the sort of having feeling unwell for the for the period of time for their migraine it really impacts their sociability their ability to work and people can be stuck in a room for for four or five days at a time and if that's recurring fairly regularly that's that's people being on their own for a while yeah because of the people that did the survey about one in eight said that they were experiencing loneliness or isolation because of their migraine it was specifically about their headache condition and I think we hear this don't we just when patients are talking and they say phrases like I've shut down my life yeah. I can't arrange anything with my friends uh, and people stop inviting them to things because they're unreliable because they never know when they're going to have a migraine yeah lots of people are arranged going to the cinema or going to the theatre and you actually can't forward plan that sort of thing so they can't put it into their schedules because of that fear of developing an attack David what about the stats about depression well I, I think a a lot of us hear that there's a correlation, a relationship. I don't think unless you've either experienced it firsthand or you, you've actually seen these these stats that so many people are so concerned, so depressed about what's happening to their lives. Yeah, I mean, 65% of, of people who we asked said that they'd experienced depression specifically linked to migraine and headaches. And actually, the, the worrying statistic was the number of people who felt suicidal or who've hurt themselves. It was 22% who felt that who self harm more than once a week due to this. I think that's absolutely shockingly high. I I was aware that people with chronic migraine do get a lot of depression and also uh, a lot of anxiety, sort of anticipatory anxiety of worrying that they might get an attack. But people expressing suicidal feelings is really just so awful, isn't it? I gave a talk the other day and uh, at the end a lady um, said to me, I I have felt suicidal uh, because of my migraine sometimes. And you know, it really brings it home to you when you hear people's stories like that. And a lot of them actually don't admit it in the first consultation. I've had a lot where I've, I've stopped, we've sort of managed to switch the migraine from being chronic, so more than 15 headache days a month to, to a to more episodic and they'll admit to me at that point I genuinely felt like I was about to, to end it all and that really brings it home. I, I th- Sorry I, th- I think it's it's really shocking when you actually see the scars on somebody's arm mm. um, as a result of mm. uh, depression induced from migraine. Mm. Um, it really rams it home that this is this is serious. I think the other thing that this highlights is not just the impact on the sufferer, but the way that that can roll out and affect families. I remember seeing a a lady who was 
suffering from really chronic migraine day after day. And she said, I can't look after my kids. We can't do anything. And then in on the reverse, the joy that people get when their headaches are relieved. You know, somebody said to me the other day, since my migraines have been helped, I can do things with my daughter at the weekend. I've ex- yeah. I managed to enjoy Christmas. So, yeah, it's the impact on the family, I think. Yeah, and a lot of family members who come along with their loved ones will say, actually, that the way that they feel really, really gets me down. So I, I also wonder yeah. how many family family members also experience mental health issues related to caring or, or being there for someone who suffers with migraine. Yeah, I just, I think, you know, it's awful watching someone suffer through a, a, a really bad attack, yeah. isn't it? It's awful. And you do feel very helpless, I think. Just going back to our survey, we... We also found there were some other um, specific things that people had noticed. So 85% experienced fatigue. Now, some of the time, I think that is due to the migraine process itself, isn't it? So people get tired in the prodromal phase during a migraine and sometimes in the postictal, postdromal phase. Yeah, absolutely. But fatigue is also, uh, it can also be a symptom of, of depression too. So yeah. it's, it's quite difficult to unpick which bits are depression related to your migraine and which bit is your ongoing attack. The same thing goes for sleep disturbances, doesn't it, really? Mm. Um, so people who are depressed often have very poor sleep. That can be a trigger. So it's a, a, a bit of a bi-directional relationship. If you're having horrible migraine attacks, you possibly uh, won't be sleeping very well and, and uh, that can aggravate depression as well. And I think that's also linked with the changes in appetite. So lack of appetite, if you're skipping meals, not eating because you feel depressed, that can trigger an attack. And if you're overeating, so eating the wrong things, having too many sugary foods, then that can um, that can also, your, those changes in blood sugar level can trigger it. David, um, I know when you are greeting people, which you do every week at the centre, you have a chat to patients. And are they easily talking to you about how they feel about their migraine or are they more reluctant to to bring it out in the open do you think it's a hidden thing well I, I think coming back to the point about isolation um this is a hidden condition um i think it takes a lot of courage to open up and um be transparent and, and share the difficulties that that you're experiencing uh, and i think the the changes in in society with um, mental health and talking about mental health Mm. generally, I I think people are becoming more willing to share and that's only got to be a good thing. I agree. I also think some people are a bit nervous because I think a lot of the, when it comes out to us, it's because we've built relationships with our patients, Mm. which we'd hope would happen with a GP as well. And a lot of patients with migraine get worried that their their migraine is being blamed on their mood. You have migraine because you're depressed. You have migraine because you're stressed. Actually, often it is the other way around. Mm. And I sometimes wonder if that stops people from highlighting their mood changes in case people take their attacks less seriously and say, well, that's what's causing it. Mm. I think there's also a certain amount of guilt and shame and people sometimes say that they they feel as if um, doctors or other healthcare professionals are, are saying, well, if only you did things differently, you wouldn't get migraine, You're, you may be contributing to your own condition. And I think that's really hard for people and so they may keep quiet about how low they feel. Yeah. I think that's particularly the case um, in the working environment. There's an awful mm. lot of fear about job uh, security, yeah. Yeah. Uh, promotion, uh, and a huge number of people um, that I speak to simply don't tell their employers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we found that in previous surveys uh, where we found that the reporting rates are more than 75% of the people with migraine even bother to report it. It's quite mm. high. It's quite low, low level reporting of it. Mm. And I think the other thing that leads to is this thing called presenteeism, which yeah. is where people are getting uh, migraine attacks, but still going into work. And of course, that has quite an impact on their um, employer as if they're not feeling completely fully functioning and up uh, up to their normal standards and they may well try and hide that because of worries about job security. Okay, that's really good. I think what we're uh, what we're going to hear from now is some experts uh, about mental health conditions and migraine. And we're also in the next section going to talk a little bit about what you can do to help yourself. So thank you very much, David, for thank you. your contribution. Pleasure. Okay, so we've talked a lot about um, our statistics 
and what people are experiencing. But what can you do to help yourself or your family member or friends who are dealing with anxiety and depression related to their migraine? There are actually quite a lot of things that we can we can do for ourselves, aren't there? Yeah. So I think um, something that I actually advise quite a lot is practicing mindfulness. Um, If you don't know what mindfulness is, it's a meditation like method where you concentrate on your breathing for a certain period of time so that you're clearing your head from any kind of negative thoughts or any thoughts, really. Yeah. Um, And that can be very, very useful for managing um, anxiety and depression. Some people find it quite hard because mm. um, one thing I think that all of our brains do is they chatter away to us and uh, if you're sitting quietly and trying to clear your mind it can be very easy to get very distracted about all the things that are worrying you so I would just say to people that's quite normal yeah. um, so it needs practice like anything if you're going to try doing mindfulness there are different ways of learning how to do it so there are books about it there are DVDs there are uh, apps that you can download onto your phone or you can go along to classes and they're usually running over about eight weeks and uh, they will kind of guide you and remind you that it's not something you can fail at just the fact that you're sitting and trying to think about your breathing and being present in the moment uh, is a very mindful practice and it can be we know from scans of people doing mindfulness that actually it can help calm the brain yeah and I I mean I I really want to highlight what you're saying about it sometimes being quite difficult it's certainly not something that works immediately so don't expect to start practicing it and feel better after your first session it's it's worth persevering with definitely sort of fitting into your regular routine I think the other thing about fitting anything like that in is is actually trying to make a regular time because Mm. even if you're doing it for just 10 minutes a day in in our busy lives I think it's it's really quite hard to set aside a peaceful 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's something you do need to work on and, and think about trying to do regularly. But it can be very, very helpful helping with anxiety and even improving sleep quality. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was actually thinking about um, other ways that you can practice it if you don't get on with mindfulness on its own. I mean, yoga essentially was developed so that people could practice mindfulness in a more Western way, I think. And I think yoga is quite a good way of practicing mindfulness, uh, which sort of brings us on to another one of our tips for how to to manage anxiety and depression exercise so there's really good evidence that exercise can be more beneficial in mild to moderate depression than antidepressants and a lot of people prefer it because they don't necessarily want to take medications and actually this is something positive that you're doing for yourself so that can be any uh, kind of exercise that you like doing um, but from a migraine point of view it's better to do little and often rather than to go and blitz it in the gym once a week and then uh, have a crashing headache as a result there was a study a while ago that showed that people who did 30 minutes of exercise about three times a week tended to have fewer migraine episodes so that's something to sort of base your target round but if you haven't been used to doing exercise then start gently. What kind of exercises would you advise people to do? I think anything that lifts your spirits while you're doing it. So um, we know that going outside in the daylight is good for depression. Just being out and in nature. So um, just go for a walk in the local park or some people are getting really into park run, aren't they? Yeah, it's a big drive at the moment, particularly in GP practices. Yeah. Getting, getting our, our doctors to put our to kind of money where in. our mouth is. I yes. guess. Um, so cycling can be good. Or if you're more somebody who wants to go and do something like swimming or an exercise class, that can be fine too. Mm. Um, also, of course, dancing. I mean, I love to dance. Do you like dancing? <laughs> I mean, I like to dance. I don't know how people like to, how much people like to see me dance, but I enjoy doing that. So yeah, that that pushes up your serotonin levels, pushes yeah. your endorphins. And the other thing is, is a thing that you often do with other people. So we know that being sociable also helps lift the mood. So anything you can do that gets you out there exercising in groups is a good idea. Yeah. You also mentioned sleep and how mindfulness can help with that. Actually, making sure that you have good quality sleep is really important for management of um, anxiety and depression. And actually, we've mentioned already how it can really affect sleep. Mm. So it can stop people from sleeping well. It can stop people from actually managing to get sleep, makes people wake up. People wake up early in the morning. So it really is important to try and regulate your sleep so that you, A, improve your migraines, but also really, really affects the mood. Yeah, I, I, there's if you... Um 
look at any sort of list of sleep hygiene things, uh, there's some very common things that people can uh, easily change, which which may improve the quality of your sleep. So obviously having only caffeine only in the morning before midday, mm. uh, having a bit of time winding down for an hour or so before you're going to bed, not being too busy and not being on the computer oh, late at night. Yeah, I mean, trying to stop all stimulating screens is how I tend to put it. So not using any television, computers, mobile phones yeah. for at least an hour before bedtime. It's so tempting to check just that last once before you go to sleep yeah but that can also spiral so you can then you you know you'd quickly look at a social media app and then you find yourself two hours later tweeting yeah (laughs) reading a book probably a bit a good way and it's sort of something that's uh going to distract your brain but you're not going to have that blue light in your eyes which Mm. we know suppresses the melatonin which is a signal to your brain to get get you off to sleep and there are actually some things that you can do to help with sleep quality so uh, i mean i know you are but i'm a big fan of magnesium supplements definitely um which do they sort of they have a calming effect they help to um to they do help sleep quality and can also improve migraine too that's true they um they can you can take magnesium in all sorts of different ways so you can take it by mouth or you can use magnesium sprays or you can use it to, by putting epsom salts in the bath you probably won't get a huge high dose of it if you're using it topically but there's quite good study evidence that taking a, a highish dose of magnesium for at least three months can help calm down the migraine attacks as well as improving the, the sleep quality and even anxiety so um it's worth a try yeah. Um, and then I think something else that that kind of leads on to is caffeine and anxiety. Yeah. So we've already talked about how you shouldn't you should avoid caffeine for at least 12 hours before bedtime um, because it does have a very long half life. It really stays in your system for a long time. And can, if you have it after midday, that can be something that affects your sleep. But caffeine also, it hits your adrenal system. So it's quite stressful. It produces a lot of adrenaline, which can make people feel very anxious in themselves. Mm. I, if you're not used to caffeine and you have it, I certainly have found this, that uh, if I have a strong coffee and I haven't been drinking much caffeine, I feel really jittery and mm. worried and anxious. Uh, so watch out for that one. And there's another thing that has been shown to be very good for chronic pain and also uh, depression that Katie introduced me to, yep. which is expressive Pick writing. Her. Yeah. So expressive writing, I think it actually has to be done with pen and paper. It's at least three three consecutive days a week. And I tell people to do it on a regular basis. You write for 30 minutes at a time, whatever comes into your head. And then you don't, you don't then read it back and process it. You throw it away. And that act of actually getting it down on paper... Um, does actually have very good evidence for improving chronic pain. It kind of feels like it's a mental detox onto paper. Um, And sometimes people think that they've got to write things down very neatly or, you know, reread it. And the idea is to get rid of it. So pour whatever you're thinking out onto paper. doesn't matter about the handwriting or the punctuation or the spelling or the language. Just write whatever you feel like writing. And uh, we know that by doing that, uh, somehow things come to the surface that you may be able to make a bit more sense of you can work on problems this way you can even have conversations with people if you've had issues with them but only on paper and um so that that's a technique called expressive writing and th- there's a sort of modified version that i say to people if you're wait if you're struggling to get off to sleep or you wake in the night with your brain chattering just have a pad of paper and a pen by the bed and sit up and write down the things that are buzzing in your head and actually just then put the paper down and tell your brain to shut up and go back to sleep and that sometimes works quite nicely so So we haven't talked about cbt and i expect lots of people will know about cbt or the full-term cognitive behavioral therapy so um do you recommend that jess i do i mean it's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of therapy and i think a type of counseling and i think people typically think of counseling they're, they're quite anti it they think oh I'm gonna have to sit down pour my thoughts out and no one's gonna I'm not gonna get any feedback from it but this this isn't like that this is much more I mean you do obviously have to do a little bit of talking about your feelings but it is much more active you're trying to work out exactly why you're feeling how you're feeling what exactly is going on in your head and then thinking of ways of actually changing that thought process yeah so it, it, it's um there's quite a bit of homework I think yeah. with CBT so you have to be in a relatively good place to make the effort to keep a diary because it's about looking at the messages that you're telling yourself so I would say to people there's an example of if you invite somebody to dinner and your friend is late 
if you're feeling anxious, then your messages to yourself may be, oh my goodness, my friend is late. Maybe they've had an accident. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I shouldn't ever invite people to dinner. It always goes wrong. If you're feeling depressed, uh, then your messages may be, oh gosh, I'm so useless. Everything I do failed. If you're feeling fine, your friend is late for dinner, then you may sit down and read the paper and think, oh, that's good. I've got an extra five minutes. So it's what we say to ourselves that can affect how we feel. And and CBT looks at that in much more detail than that simple example that I've given. (laughs) (laughs) Not just doing a session here. (laughs) (laughs) No. The other thing is uh, there's a a whole load of of kind of negative thought patterns. And normally when I'm talking to patients about them, I give a few examples. I see them nodding and recognising it. So Mm. so disappointing missing the positive so somebody says to you oh you look nice today and in your head you go they don't really mean that or you spill a cup of coffee and then you say to yourself oh I'm so useless at everything but actually you've just spilled a cup of coffee so you know it's it's worth kind of looking into that because it can be so helpful yeah there are also lots of organizations that can support you if you are feeling anxious or depressed so mind and young mind are two good examples of that and I think if you're really struggling to know what would work best for you it is worth reaching out to having a look at those reaching out to them seeing what they can do to support you and help they have loads of information on their websites um the other thing I'm a big fan of books actually and there are loads of books out there if you are a book lover like me um there's books on depression books on anxiety some of them are people's personal journeys and some of them are just generally very helpful about explaining what's going on there's a a whole series called an introduction to managing depression anxiety or whatever um so i think what we're saying basically is there's loads of help out there. Yeah. I think it's really important not not to feel that you're alone, yeah. not to feel that there's nothing that can be done. Yeah. Um, because actually there is a lot of help and support. You just need to know where to go. You may be able to just go to your GP and have a chat to them. Um, and also, as we said, lots of online resources. Hopefully that will be helpful to manage your own feelings and the way that migraine has impacted on you but also if you're supporting somebody else with migraine uh, maybe have a look into some of these things that we've suggested and and uh, tell them about it we heard from ian lee a broadcaster and writer who told us his personal struggle with migraine and you'll be hearing this now Hello, my name is Ian Lee. I'm a radio presenter. I host the Late Night Alternative weeknights from 10 on Talk Radio. And you may have seen me in I'm a Celebrity a couple of years ago stealing some strawberries. Um, I just thought I would briefly, I didn't spontaneously think I was asked, and I agreed, to to share some of my experiences with migraines. I've had migraines since I was about eight or nine. I've been really lucky that I don't think I've had one for a couple of years. Um, But when I get them, they are just the most painful things in the world. I kind of get a little bit of a warning that I'm going to get them um, in that I get a headache, but it's it's different from a headache. It's in a very specific part of my head. It's kind of just above my left eye to the right slightly of it. And also at the base of my neck, I get this throbbing and I get a very thin thick head. Um, A headache for me is quite sharp and this is quite thick. And when I get that, I try and drink coffee and eat chocolate. I know it's counterintuitive and and for some people those those can be triggers uh, for migraines. But if I drink coffee and eat chocolate early enough, that can stop me, stop the migraine developing any further and, and it will either go completely or it will just become a dull head. I do also take quite a lot of Nurofen as well if I need to. And if I don't get that, ah oh man, I'm in big trouble. The migraines can go on for two or three days, normally about two days. Uh, the pain is indescribable. My, I, I want to die. You know, that is no exaggeration. I want to rip my head off and die. I throw up a lot. I kind of go blind. It's a weird blindness where I can sort of see things, but I can't see them. It, it's such a hard thing to describe, and it's full of contradictions, and it's so horrible. I tell you something that works really well for me if I do get a migraine is sitting in my is being cold. So if I'm at home, I will open all the windows and um, try and get a draft in. The best place for me to sit with a migraine is in my car with the air conditioning on full blast, and I don't know if that thins the blood or does something and that can offer me um 
relief, really. My body will contort and tense up and will go into all kinds of awkward positions to try and take the pain from my head and, and sort of put it somewhere else. It's really horrible. The relief, there will be a period when I know the migraine is going, I'll shiver. I'll get two or three huge shivers that, that, that will just cause my body to, to convulse. And they'll start at the top of my head and shiver all the way down my spine to my feet. And, and if I get three of those, I know I'm on the other side and I'm coming out. Um, I've tried... Oh, that's my phone going. I've tried other things. I've tried... I remember my neurologist gave me some magnetic pulse thing to try that he said this is a proper doctor he said was uh, working for some people it never worked uh, for me touchwood i haven't had one for a couple of years i've come close to having one but i've managed to stop it i think i have taken a lot of the stressful things out of my life that uh, were, were possibly partly responsible for it and i just you know wish everybody that has them the best of luck coming through them thank you very much for listening Next up, we'll be talking to Dr. Kate Barnes, who is a cognitive behaviour therapy practitioner and also does some hypnotherapy in her practice and, and talking to us about how this can help. Today, I am talking with Dr. Kate Barnes and we're going to be talking about the use of CBT in hypnotherapy. Um, tell me a bit about what you do in your practice, Kate, with these. Okay. So um, I've been doing CBT probably for about um, six or seven years now and often combine it with hypnotherapy. Um, I thought perhaps I'd start by telling you a bit about what CBT is. Um, it was a treatment that was developed by um, Aaron Beck, who was an American psychiatrist in the 1960s. CBT is short for cognitive behaviour therapy. And um, in a nutshell... Uh, I would say that it's a therapy that looks at our thoughts um, and how it affects our feelings and consequently our behaviour. Yeah, it's been used in this country for quite a long time, hasn't it? It has been used in this country for quite a long time. It's become a very popular treatment in recent years, basically because there's quite a lot of evidence to show it works and mm -hmm. um, certainly the medical profession have really embraced it. It's a very logical treatment and, and people can benefit from just five or six sessions yeah so it's something that's been used in the nhs yes. and is quite readily so to say a bit more about it we all get accustomed to thinking in certain ways mm -hmm. we all get habituated in our thinking and it's really about looking at this with the patient and helping them to challenge some of their thinking we look at aspects that we call NAPs and NAPs stand for negative automatic thoughts so can you tell me a bit more about the negative automatic yeah. thoughts I think uh, there are quite a few different types aren't there there are so one of the most common types is mind reading and that's where we think we know what somebody else is thinking which of course when you really start thinking about it is ridiculous so that's really when people say things like well they must be thinking this yes yeah they must think i'm fat yeah they must think i'm an idiot that kind of thing catastrophic thinking it's the end of the world yeah. when clearly the sky isn't falling down yeah um, other things such as generalizations where we're using our internal dialogue and saying to ourselves things like this always happens okay no one ever does this this never happens. So when you say internal dialogue, you're meaning the messages we tell ourselves about things. Exactly that. Polarised, black and white thinking, where we impose a judgment on ourselves mm -hmm. and we use words such as, I should do this, I must do this. Oh, that's a common one. I, I definitely have mm -hmm. uh, recognised that one, yeah. Blaming, either blaming other people or self-blame. Emotional reasoning, which is where we understand that our thinking or helping people to understand how our thinking may be distorted by our present mood state okay what how can you clarify that a bit more so yeah so say somebody's um going through a period of time where they're feeling low mm -hmm. then clearly that's going to cloud their thinking and judgment and it's helping them to see that ah. and to make allowances for that so because they're low, they are thinking in a slightly different way than if they were feeling in yes, a much better frame of mind. Exactly yeah. that. So it's about identifying those sort of thought patterns. But then what can you do about it? Right. So 
it's about helping people to step back mm. and look at challenging some of this thinking and showing them that they do actually have a choice and that they don't always have to think in a particular way. Mm. Habits are hard to break. That's right. Mm. One of the ways in which you can do that is to get them to do activities where they actually do something different from what they're accustomed to doing Mm -hmm. and showing them that they can get a different result. You're suggesting to people that they try doing things in a different way so that they get a different result. I think, can that be simple, practical, physical things like brushing your teeth with the other hand? Um, Or would it be more patterns of behaviour that they're looking at? It depends, actually. Um, I think one of the things that it's really um, important to get across to people is that it's not just about how your thoughts can affect your feelings, can affect your behaviour. If you change your behaviour, then Mm -hmm. sometimes you can change your thought patterns as well so Mm. it's like a sort of feedback loop Mm -hmm. i've come across that where people are feeling so low and they they tell themselves that they won't enjoy going out and doing something with their family and then if you can actually persuade them to try going and doing it they often enjoy it much more than they thought they would yes yeah i mean i often think of that phrase feel the fear and do it anyway yes yes and sometimes you just got to do it and then you realize actually that the thoughts follow the change in behavior yeah though there sounds as if there could be quite a bit of homework with cbt there can be i must admit the kate barnes way of doing it doesn't necessarily (laughs) involve a lot of homework (laughs) and i think you know if you follow the sort of strict protocols that the cognitive behavior therapists use it often does involve quite sort of rigid framework Mm. of doing homework but because i tend to combine my cognitive behavior therapy with hypnotherapy i probably practice it in a slightly different way from from most people brilliant Um, tell me a bit about hypnotherapy because that's something uh, i think a lot of people are interested in but then they have worries that they're going to be controlled or or there's a lot of myths around hypnotherapy aren't there i think you're absolutely right about that and that's one of the things that i'm always trying to dispel with people because when people come and see me i think often they are very wary and they're not really quite sure what i'm going to do to them yes (laughs) and so generally one of the first things i'll say is that actually it's no different from relaxation Mm. what you're doing is helping to put the person into a relaxed state Mm. and by putting them into a relaxed state you're bypassing the critical conscious part of the mind so you're helping them relax themselves you're not doing something to them you you are helping them to relax by giving them the right cues Mm. to help them do Mm. it so you're doing that and in doing that you're helping them to you're you're basically bypassing the critical conscious part of the mind and then you're getting into the unconscious part of the mind which is where all the habits and values and attitudes are stored and you're making suggestions to the unconscious part of the mind because that's where the change really occurs Mm. it that does sound quite wacky but actually it it works beautifully Mm. and i think you can teach anybody to relax Mm. but the brilliant thing is and people often don't think about this, is that if you can teach somebody to be relaxed, then they can't possibly be anxious or stressed. Right. Because you cannot have two conflicting emotions at the same time. I think with pain patients, self-learning to do self-hypnosis can be really, really useful Mm. because it removes the stress element of what's going on. Yeah. So have you come across um, using these techniques with people with chronic migraine or with chronic pain? I do. Um, I use these treatments for all sorts of different things, Mm -hmm. but um, I do see patients with pain conditions such as migraine. And in fact, I was just thinking, I saw somebody the other week, and I thought I'd just maybe give an example. And she was a patient who had come to see me who was struggling with migraine. She led a busy life. She was a mother of four, and she had a part-time job. And she was telling me about her experience the week before, where she had been given this project to do, and there was a deadline. She had to get it finished by the end of a particular day the week before. She just had one of those days where her nanny rang up in the morning her after school nanny and said that she was sick so she knew that she had to rush to pick her kids up from school Mm -hmm. she then got phoned by a friend during the day saying would she mind if she picked her child up which was from another school which she then 
did All agree to do. All happens at once. Yep. All happens at once. So she found herself having the most crazy day where she was running around like a headless chicken. She got through the day. She managed to fulfil her obligations at work, completed the project, not having had anything to eat or drink uh, all day. Uh, all alarm bells ringing. Yeah. <laughs> and then she, yeah, she rushed to pick this other child up from school. She then rushed to drop two of her kids at two different after-school activities, got home, and rather unsurprisingly, later that night, got a migraine so we talked through some of this stuff and this is where the cbt techniques can be quite useful just looking at the thought processes behind how she managed her day and how she could look at doing things slightly differently of course she realized when we went through the negative automatic thoughts that there were these sort of thought processes going on would her boss think she was a slacker if she didn't get the project done Mm -hmm. he might have done or he might not but does it really matter but Mm. to her it was she extrapolated it further to if i don't get this project done then what will he think i could get fired and the whole thing catastrophized exactly Mm -hmm. getting out of proportion her friend ringing her up and asking her to pick up the child she thought if i say no it comes across as i'm being really unhelpful she then felt quite angry about it because actually this friend wasn't always particularly good at reciprocating but she didn't really right. feel that she could say no and then you know we spoke about the kids and their after school activities actually how important was it that they really did them you know yeah. was it actually fine to miss them on one occasion of course, she, she realised when we were talking about it, well, no, but at the time it yeah. was, oh, I'm not being a perfect mother, I'm not getting my mm-hmm. child to these after-school activities. We realised that actually she hadn't particularly managed that day well and she'd ended up, as a result of not looking after herself, with a migraine and then she was clearly no good to anybody. Yes. Anyway. So it all came tumbling down despite yeah. her attempts to keep all those balls up in the air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's a kind of example of where CBT techniques can be quite useful. Yeah. Looking how to looking at how to manage um, migraine. Clearly, it's not a cure for migraine, but these sort of things are quite. But by changing her priorities, she might have stopped, had lunch, and had a more relaxing evening if she had thought about it in a slightly different way. It's about learning how to manage one's lifestyle, really, isn't it? And the the stress elements that can trigger migraine. That's excellent. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Charlotte spoke to two of our patients about their experiences with migraine and mental health, and here's what they had to say. Hello Nathan, thank you for joining us today. It's Migraine Awareness Week and we are concentrating on migraine and mental health this week. So I just wanted to discuss that with you a little bit. Okay, great. So have you felt the sort of migraines ever affected your mental health? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, And how would you describe that to someone if you sort of how it's affected your mental well-being in general? Hmm, It's a difficult question. Um, I mean... I guess that migraines have really, really does affect um, most people's mental health, but especially with with myself, I tend to go in a really dark place, if, especially if I've had migraines for a long period of time. Yeah, so you're going through that sort of cycle. Often. Yeah, it's because I guess because you're in a dark room all the time. It kind of, and you're by yourself. There's no one to really offload, and it's just pain fixed with being lonely, mm-hmm. and then you feel you feel like you're not understood and there's a whole bunch of emotions that that start flying around and yeah that's one thing we we found um, when we did our survey is that a lot of people feel isolated and alone like you just said yeah the isolation is can be pretty um can be pretty hard to deal with yeah and do you ever feel sort of anxious and get sort of anxiety because of that kind of feeling alone and not knowing when the attack's going to happen I definitely feel anxious when it comes mm-hmm. to the, when when the attacks happen. Like I, mm-hmm. I'm at the moment, I find it really difficult to to go out to like enjoy stuff with my friends or family. Just yeah. because if I leave too far from my home, if I have an attack, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. So I get quite nervous about planning. Like my cousin's in a of musical, course. and I can't. I don't want to promise someone I can go to it because then you might have to cancel on them, and then you feel guilty and things like that. And it just yeah, I might have to cancel. I'm, oh, I might have an attack oh. in the venue. Yeah, it's, it's just that quite... fear, isn't it? Of when's it going to come? Is it going to come? Yes, yeah, very. And do you find you get sort of mood changes as well because of it? Do you? Yeah. yeah? yeah. <laughs> I feel I feel sorry for my brother and dad. Oh. <laughs> I, I definitely have my ups and downs, and it, it's quite it, it's quite. 
it's quite spiky with me. It's like mm. all of a sudden calm, and then one I'll be like, why? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, are they quite understanding though? Because yeah, they yeah, must I, have seen you go through it. And I after after I do it, I explain. Sorry, it's, it's not. I just I'm in pain. Or I, I apologize. Kind yeah. of. Yeah. And so, um, have you found that anything sort of helped you cope with those kind of feelings? I've never found anything that no. could help me personally. I just kind of just having people around you that sort of understand. Yeah, I just, yeah, bear with it and like hope my friends kind of understand, friends and family understand what what my spikes kind of and what the cause is really. Yeah, and so if you know the people listening to this podcast, um, some of them might be feeling very similar to yourself. So mm. what would you sort of say to them if they are having those kind of you know migraines are impacting their mental well being? What would you say to them? I mean, at the time when you're having a migraine, you you might be in a very dark place, but it's gonna end once you come out of the pain period. Just try and enjoy yourself as much as possible before your next attack if it if it's coming soon if it's coming later just try focus on the positive instead of the negatives that's that's how i kind of no i think that's a great that's great fantastic well thank you so much for joining us and um, that was really really great and i hope you know that people out there sort of realize that you're not alone and that there are people that feel just like you do definitely not alone <laughs> <laughs> thank you Hi, Abby. Thanks so much for joining us on our podcast this week. Um, So it's Migraine Awareness Week and we're concentrating on migraine and mental health. Um, So how has sort of uh, migraine affected your mental health? Has it and sort of in what ways? Um, I think it's had quite a big impact on my mental health. A lot of it, I think, is because of the impact it's had on my life as a whole. So Mm -hmm. I've missed a lot of work because of my migraines. I've um, ended up in absence meetings um, and the stress and anxiety that comes with that, with it ha- impacting on my way of making a living. Um, yeah, of course. Is, yeah, it's really detrimental. <laughs> and then yeah. obviously the uh, the anxiety causes me to have more migraines. Like I get stress triggers. Um, so it's kind of a self-perpetuating. One, yeah, problem. yeah, it just goes round and round in a circle. Yeah, I can imagine. That's, that's awful. Um, and have you found any other ways that it sort of has impacted your mental health? Or is it mostly that kind of anxiety of and the stress of having them? I mean, also the migraine itself obviously causes quite a lot of anxiety. Um, mm. And I, I guess having the pain constantly. I mean, are you a chronic migraine sufferer? Is, I am, yeah. Um, yeah. But only as of... I think it was March last year. They were episodic before then, and I had medication that was mostly working. But I had a really severe attack at work um, that was all sound-based, like just intensely sound-sensitive. Um, oh, and after that, it took a long time for it to start to sort of even out again. And I was really, really anxious during that time just about leaving the house because I was so easily triggered. Uh I, I couldn't go and sit in a cafe because just the sound of the coffee mich- coffee grinder going on oh would set me off immediately. Oh, so yeah, I can imagine that. That must be awful then because you can't do anything in that, you know, because there's noise everywhere. So Yeah, I was just going to say that it's sort of, it has slightly improved in that respect over time, but then it does, it has a big impact on the way you approach everything. Because every mm. time you go anywhere, you have to consider, well, what possible triggers are there going to be? What do I have to do to, um, to make sure that that is less likely to happen? Or if I do get an attack, what am I going to do? If I'm at a, a festival or something, how am I going to leave, um, you know, as quickly yeah, as possible? Yeah, how am I yeah going it's to like sort safely? of constant fear of living of like, when it's when is it going to happen? I mean, yeah. I, I don't drive at the moment, but um, I can imagine if you drive to places and you get a migraine and then you know you're not safe to drive back that leaves you in this kind of you're stuck yeah (laughs) because you can't get in the car safely but you also can't stay where you are I've actually heard that from some people yeah that's yeah and that can be really scary especially if you get auras while you're driving as well yeah Yeah. because that affects your vision affects my judgment and my reaction speed so much yeah yeah. I wouldn't be safe um I cycle a lot of places and if I do get a migraine and have to leave work early or something I have to make myself walk because I just know I'm not safe I've I've um, had a couple of accidents falling off my bike because I cycled when I had a migraine starting and thought I'd be okay yeah it's it's very scary actually isn't it um so have you found sort of ways that you've sort of been able to deal with things you know have has anything sort of helped combat your sort of the migraines and also maybe how it affects your mental health has anything helped you yeah I, I mean in part I just over time I've develop sort of a routine about how I approach things and um what I can take with me to help me sort of my migraine emergency kit but Mm -hmm. in terms of just processing sort of the feelings and the anxiety itself 
um, I've actually found art really helpful. Okay, well, that's so, nice. So do you do a lot of art then? I know, you, I think you're doing an exhibit, aren't you, soon? Soon, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a degree in illustration and I do a lot of digital art, which when my migraines first went chronic, that was one of the things I found the hardest was that I couldn't do that anymore. Uh, mm. I could only spend like half an hour on the computer at a time. <laughs> As I got better and started being able to draw more, I decided to try and channel the way I was feeling through my artwork and started making illustrations about my experiences with uh, with migraine. Mm. And I found that really cathartic. And then I started connecting with other people online that also had migraines or chronic illnesses and just sort of keyed into this whole online community. And I think that helped a lot with the, the isolation yeah yeah definitely um and we actually i must say that to anyone listening that um actually the heads up podcast that is the uh, our logo is actually lovely you you'd created that and let us use that so that that was really wonderful and i think you the way you ha- do your art is really expressive and i think really helps to when you can't s- visualize what migraine looks like to actually be able to see it is um you know, you. I think that sort of helps people, especially when people don't suffer themselves. So, yeah, no, thank started, you very much for that. <laughs> that's right. It started as just uh, something to help myself process the feelings, but the more I made them, the more positive responses I got about people being able to visualise what it was like and and seeing their own experiences expressed in the work. So, yeah, yeah I'm really glad that I kind of gone in this direction. Yeah, I think it, I think it's really important for people to know that because it's such a misunderstood condition. Um, and yes, yeah, so thank you very much. If anyone listening is in the Cambridge area on the 14th of September, then please feel free to check out Abby's exhibit, which she's holding to raise funds for our charity, the National Migraine Centre, which will help us continue our mission helping those suffering with debilitating migraines and headaches. So we've talked a lot about anxiety, depression and migraine today. Please don't forget that if you need more support, then you can always contact Mind or Young Minds. And if you are feeling like you're struggling, there's always the Samaritans and they can be contacted on 116123. There are other resources available out there and we've mentioned some of them. The Migraine Trust has an advocacy service, so it's well worth looking at their website. And of course, you could always call your own GP or dial 111 if it's an out of hours uh, time of day. Thank you very much to everybody who's been involved in this special edition of our podcast for mental health and migraine in this Migraine Awareness Week. Uh, A special thank you to our guests and our patients who contributed. For our next podcast, we'll we'll start talking about migraine management. We'll be discussing some of the interventions for the migraines. And if you have any questions on this topic or suggestions for any other topics we might want to do in the future, please email us. Yep, we want this to be useful for you. So keep your comments coming you've been listening to the heads up podcast if you want more information or have any comments email us on info at nationalmigraincenter.org.uk till next time